Jim Graham Jones here to talk about mongrels a little bit. Um, what happened was I just had that, that paranoia that you always get after you publish a novel that did I remember to put that person in the acknowledgments. So I flipped the acknowledgments, read them for the first time since writing them probably, and, um, and I realized that a lot of the questions I've been answering about mongrels I can answer like through the Rosetta Stone of the acknowledgments. So maybe not a lot of them. I can answer some of them. So you know, if I'm coming to your town, maybe don't listen to this. But I can't come to all the towns either. So um, we'll see what I can do here. I'll I'll try to bounce through the names. Um, I'll start out reading it. I've never actually read acknowledgments out loud. It's kind of weird. Thanks to those who don't even know I'm involving them in this. Art Spiegelman. Um, so the reason I feel like um, smuggling him in here, you know, against his will, possibly, is that I wrote Modern Girls right on the heels of um, a reread of Mouse, like the 50th reread, I don't know. And, um, you know, he has fun, like the French are frogs, um, of course, the Jews are mice, and the Swedes are kind of reindeer, and, you know, it's all it's all fun with animal heads, you know. And um, But when they're back in... America, they're up at uh, up at um, Vladek's cabin at the lake, I think, and they're coming back from it. They pick up a hitchhiker, and um, and looking at that hitchhiker, I realized that um, oh no, what what if a hitchhiker had been American Indian? And then I thought, oh man, would Spiegelman have drawn him with a wolf head? And because that's what's done to Indians over and over. Every truck stop you see, there's a T-shirt with a howling wolf with wearing a headdress or a blanket with a noble wolf like superimposed on a Indian who is supposedly, who's surely dead, you know? Um, that's the image of Indians and wolves that America kind of has a fetish for, you know? And I'm not at all saying that Spiegelman would have been indelicate enough to do something like that, but I'm saying that I had that fear when I read that part of the graphic novel again, or the graphic memoir, I guess I should say. Um, and so I thought, man, this has been going on too long. I gotta, if, if anybody's gonna do it, maybe it better be me, you know? Um, and I'm, maybe I can do it right, maybe I can't, I don't know. But that's my stab anyways. Okay, after Spiegelman comes Leslie Silko, Leslie Marmon Silko, and um, the way I'm smuggling her in, or the way I feel like she's influencing mongrels anyways, is her novel Ceremony. Um, you remember that well, yeah, I say you remember like everybody reads Ceremony. I don't know if everybody reads Ceremony. If you've read Ceremony, you know that there's that cattle, that the, the pure the pure blood cattle, the purebred cattle, the um, the ones with good bloodlines, they don't make it out in the dry scrub and the heat, you know? They, they, they fall over quick and die. But the ones that live are the mongrels. And um, I think they use, a, I think that word is even used in Ceremony, mongrels. They're the tougher, more hardy breed, you know? Which is really largely why this is called mongrels. Um, and, you know, I learned that firsthand. We had a, a dog um, catch parvo and die. And, you know, it's all not a happy experience, of course. Um, but parvo gets in the in the dirt of your backyard for seven years. You were always here. You can't bleach it out. You can't burn it out. You can't do nothing. So um, I went to the, we went to get another puppy, or we got a puppy to because we need another dog, you know. And um, on the... And, what the I talked to the vet first. I called the vet and I said, "Hey man, what's the what kind of breed is going to survive parvo?" And he said, "He said there ain't no breed that's going to survive parvo." He said, "The best you can do is get a dog that's a cross, that's a mongrel, you know." And so we did. We got a cross, a Great Dane cross. He he came to the house. He caught he caught parvo like he's supposed to. He nearly died for about two weeks, and now he's been around for eleven years. You know, mongrels survive. Um, I believe in mongrels. Man, we're only like, this is only the second line of this acknowledgement. Um, Rob Zombie, he has, um, the reason, I mean, I don't know if, the reason he, he's here is that he has that line in Foxy Foxy, he is the mongrel, he wants it all. And I thought that's Darren right there, you know, and that's kind of also the narrator of mongrels. He is the mongrel, he wants it all. That may be the epigraph. If I, if I write the next two installments of Mongrels, that may very well be the epigraph of one of them. Joan Osborne may, may get the other epigraph, I'm not sure yet. Um, after that, it's George Martin, um, George R. Martin. And, the, and the, re, the way that he kind of influenced or, yeah, Mongrels is his novella Skin Trade, in which he has, um, what's his name? I can't suddenly can remember. Willie. Is it Willie? 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 I think it's Willie. I think it's Willie, the 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 werewolf who's also a um what's he a debt collector kind of dude, and um, that's not the right word, but um he 
is a skinny kind of ragged werewolf. You know, he's like a quarter blood or something, um, which matters in, for these werewolves in skin trade. And um, more than that, he has to, oh, he's always shooting on his inhaler, you know, because he's an asthmatic werewolf. And um, that really, I've read that, I read that novella a lot of times, and I read it at kind of formative times in my life. And that really impressed upon me that not all werewolves are nine foot tall and grand and going to kill the world. You know, some of them are just scraping by. Willie was scraping by over and over and over. Really, the way I always imagine Willie looking, it's not quite how he looks in the graphic novel adaptation. I always imagine him looking like Professor Lupin in um, Harry Potter. And Harry Potter, what is that? Three, I think it's three. Um, Yeah, Harry Potter three. Prisoner of Azkaban. I think that's where Lupin comes up. Um, I love that skinny kind of werewolf, you know? That, that's the kind I prefer. I think that that kind can move through the trees fast. And that's what you got to do if you're a werewolf. You don't stand up and fight up the front of the inf infantry lines. You're a gorilla warrior. You run around, th you run like smoke through the trees, you yeah? know? All right, we're going to the third line. Gerald Visner, he talks about mongrel theory. Um, and I think in his novel, Chair of Tears, right? Um, but anyways, he talks about it not quite like Silco does, but in the Gerald Bisner way, which is pretty much always the right way, because the dude's so smart and so talented. Um, Louise Erdrich, the way I feel like I'm sneaking her in, um, is her novel Love Medicine, which is, you know, one of the best novels ever written in the world, you know? But um, I love the way Love Medicine is built like stories, or it's, the chapters are stories. Lots of them were published individually, and they didn't all have the same names before they were published. I mean, you hear that kind of stuff. I don't know, who knows how, how the thing actually happened. But um, that always impressed me so much that she could go without a distinct, like, find the key kind of plot and still tell a story that was so emotionally engaging. That impressed me like nothing else. I've read that novel so many times. It would be impossible, like, Really, one of my novels, um, which one is it? Is it Leadfeather? It is dedicated to June Morrissey, you know, which is the first character we see from Louise Erdrich in her novels anyways. Um, all right, we're still on the third line. Barry Lopez, um, how I feel like I'm pulling him in is his um, big book of Wolves and Men. Is it Up Wolves and Men or Wolves and Men? I suddenly can't remember. I don't have it right here either. Um, anyways, that novel, it's not just about like, biology or ecosystems or anything it plums like the cultural resonances in it of, of wolves it takes a sounding of our association as a people with wolves and it's so so good i think i've only read that twice i want to read it again that's so good if it's an audio novel i need to get an audio novel too um lopez is such a fine delicate nuanced writer you know his brain works so well and man when he's talking about wolves he's he's firing on all cylinders um oh goodwill hunting i'll let y'all find that there's a line in mongrels that's smuggled directly from goodwill hunting um it wasn't there in the very first draft either i was writing mongrels and then i happened to watch goodwill hunting in the middle of writing mongrels and i'm like oh i should use that you know uh james welch the way i feel like i'm smuggling him in it's not just that he's black feet and i'm black feet so i see lines of influence i don't really think that's valid, you know, or I can't claim that anyways. But um, his novel, Winter in the Blood, is so episodic, you know, and this is a this is an episodic novel too. And so I feel like he kind of gave me license to do this a little bit, if that makes sense. Um, you know, you always hear that, who is it, William Kittredge, when Welch was writing Winter in the Blood, he went to Kittredge and said, he said, I'm a poet, I can't write a novel. And um, I don't know what to do. I can't conceptualize all these plot turns, this big old 300-page thing. And Kittredge tells him, he says, um, he says, dude, it's not about that. You don't got to see the whole thing at once. You just got to write a lot of scenes. And after you write enough scenes, it becomes a novel. And James Welch did that, gave us Winter in the Blood, which is one of the most amazing novels we've got. You know, so it can work. You know, I'm a big proponent of plot. I'm a big proponent of a body on the floor on the first page. And the rest of the novel is trying to figure out what how that body got there. But at the same time, there are wonderful things that can happen in other directions, you know? All right. Ooh, we're on the fourth line. Near Dark. Um, Near Dark showed me that the, the 1987 movie about vampires, it showed me that monsters don't have to be grand and like, 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 like these Greek gods, like operating at a level that is alien to me in my experience, you know? Near Dark showed me that, um, that monsters 
are just people, one, and it showed me, two, that they don't, they're not automatically financially successful. They're not whizzes at the stock market. They can't get the good job. They can't get the good car. They don't buy the good clothes. These are people I can believe in. This is how I grew up, you know? Um, the vampires in Near Dark, they live in stolen vans that they black out the windows, and they just kind of barely make it from town to town, and they find another neck to chomp, and they move on to the next town. And um, if anything was my direct model for mongrels it was near dark and um it actually kind of thrills me that a lot of the reviews i've been seeing for mongrels mention near dark and i'm like wow that, that, that's such an honor that people would see something as amazing as near dark reflected in you know some diminutive way in my novel um all right man i'm getting out of breath talking about all this um let's see then i thank people who read it um Josh Malkin and Zach Lentz, those dudes will talk werewolves until there's no more werewolf to talk, which is great. Bill Rapkin, um, what he taught me, he didn't like sit down and teach me this, like I'm going to give you a lecture, Stephen, but um, not that he, he would if I asked him probably, but um, he has a book called Writing the TV Pilot, which is amazing. And um, it doesn't only apply to, 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 to script writing. It applies if you understand how the pilot works in relation to the whole series, then you understand how the first chapter of a novel works in relation to the, all the rest of the chapters. I've read this book twice now, and I'll probably read it more because there's things I need to be reminded of. You know, um, Ray Cluley and his um, his novella or novelette or long story, Water for Drowning. He has um, a girl who's associated who is not associated. She is um, fixated on mermaids. And it's a wonderful, wonderful novella. I love that novella, her story, her novelette, whatever it is. Um, Cluley can write. But um, what happens is a guy goes to her bedroom at her house. Her, she lives with her parents. He goes into her room and he's like, whoa, because everything in her bedroom is mermaid related. You know, towels, curtains, figurines, bedspread, everything is mermaid related. And um, I stole that directly for the um, Layla chapter. Um, Layla, or... Well, she's not Layla. In the, she's not Layla in the chapter, but um, that's how her bedroom is decorated, all with wolf stuff, you know. Um, so thank you, Ray, for letting me steal that. And also, I didn't ask if I could steal it, but thank you after the fact. Um, William Cobb, he told me he taught me something in grad school. He was one of my he was my one of my main professors in grad school. He, well, I can't. This is gonna spoil. I can't spoil the novel. Um. What he told me was you only get one novel like this, and this is my one novel like this. Um, he told me save it. Don't don't do it at first. Um, so I'm glad. Thank, I'm glad that he kind of told me to wait. You know, um, um, Craig Wheeler I used to work with that dude at the library. Um, what I stole from him was it's in the Heaven of Werewolves where somebody oh where the narrator who is a vampire at the time is asking Darren. Are they going to this? Are the are the other kids walking on the sidewalk going to the same church we're going to? And um, Darren says no, they go to a different church, and that's exactly line for line something I heard Craig say one day. Um, he said it actually. I was talking to him and one other dude. Um, it was really a clever phrasing. I thought I'm lucky to have been standing there, and I'm lucky to have remembered it all this time. Um. Definitely Sabine Baron Gold. He gave us werewolves back in, what, 1863 or something like that. Um, He wouldn't, yeah. And he just wrapped all the lore up and said, I love this stuff. Why don't you love it too? You know, I really appreciate that. I'm glad he said, he preserved a lot of those werewolf stories for us. Um, Herodotus, you know, Herodotus, I mean, him and Virgil and um, the dude who wrote Satyricon, is that Petronius? Um, they were all telling us like these kind of, you know, folktale kind of werewolf stories. I like um, Herodotus's one in the histories because it's about the Neuri. What is it? N-U-E-R-I? N-E-U-R-I? I forget. Anyways, there's some dudes who once every like seven years, they turn into a wolf and run around. Um, that was really the pattern in a lot of the old werewolf stories is that you're not always a wolf, but sometimes cyclical nature, you turn into a wolf. Back then it wasn't the moon, you know? Um, but I'm, I'm thankful that those, those, those way back writers thought werewolf stories were fascinating enough to write them down. I mean, there's werewolves in Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, um, some people say Lyokun is the first werewolf. Um, we've had werewolves with us forever. As long as we've had wolves, we've had werewolves. Anyways, I'll probably make a lecture from this someday. Um, but not today. Today, this is the abbreviated version. Um, 
Oh, and Kurt C. Old Mac. Oh, good grief. That, you know, that's probably the most prime influence on Mongrels is um, 1941's The Wolfman. And um, what happened, you know, I realized I'm writing a werewolf story and I wanted to, I wanted to kind of do what Max Brooks did. He synthesized all of zombie lore into a single creature. And I wanted to, uh, instead of just saying, oh, the rest of y'all suck, I'm going to do it this way. I wanted to do the werewolf in a way that accounted for the things that had come before. You know, I think that's a more honest way to go at it. And um, it's a lot more difficult anyways. And sometimes, I guess sometimes what's difficult is the honest way, huh? Anyway, maybe that's not true. But um, you'll notice in The Wolfman that when Gwen's chaperone, when... Lawrence Talbot comes to take her to get her palm read at the gypsy camp. She brings her chaperone, I forget that woman's name, and um, chaperone gets attacked in the background, kind of in silhouette, by a werewolf who is Bella Lugosi, conveniently named Bella, you know. And um, you'll notice that werewolf is a German Shepherd. I mean, it's supposed to be a wolf, but, it, you know, it, whatever it is, it's a four-footed thing. It's completely transformed. That wolf bites Lawrence Talbot. Lawrence Talbot then becomes this man wolf. You know, he's got a wolf head, wolf hands, wolf feet, wolf hunger. Um, he doesn't have much of a brain, but um, he's got a person body. He's a wolf man. He's a man wolf. He doesn't become like the thing that bit him. And that never made sense to me. And I refuse to ascribe that simply to special effects limitations of 1941. I think it's kind of an insult to the movie. What I did instead was I assumed maybe that's the way it is. You know, maybe if you're born into a family of werewolves, then your body is built such that it can um, contain a transformation. It can go all the way, you know? Um, but... And that, but then, if that werewolf who can go all the way into you know some sort of wolf form bites someone else and infects them with what it has, then that person who is not born into the blood cannot go all the way. That person gets stuck halfway through with a wolf head, wolf hands, wolf feet, wolf hunger. And but what's most important is they get stuck in a state of immense, immense continuing pain because they're between states. Their skull is trying to be this, trying to be that. You know, their teeth are in, they're out. Um, all they know is to bite. Those man wolves, they last like two nights, maybe three, you know, whereas a Bella Lugosi werewolf, they can last a long time as long as they don't meet some dude with a silver-headed cane. Anyways, um, so that's, so yeah, Wolfman was so, so influential for mongrels. Um, oh, a friend of mine, Wally Trinoff, we were having dinner one night and um, he was talking about Jewish burial customs, which I know you're thinking, is that dinner conversation? Evidently it was. I don't remember what was happening. And um, I just read Todd Goldberg's Gangsterland at the time. And that's also about a dude. Uh, well, it's a, it, has, it involves some burial custom stuff, you know, kind of hiding bodies. But um, And I realized that this could work to the werewolf's advantage. You know, it could be a free meal if you're desperate. And so I smuggled it into my book. So thank you, Wally Trinoff and Todd Goldberg. Um, J Jeff Barnaby's rhymes for young for young ghouls. They just the whole. I don't know. There's some. I I actually can't make a one to one correlation of what I stole from that, but I stole something from rhymes for young ghouls from my roles. It's the feel. I think it's the kids. I don't know. But that movie, I've watched it a few times, and it never ceases to have an impact on me. Um, and I feel like whatever juice it has, I tried to steal a few drops of it from mongrels um we're about halfway through here these are all the early readers eddie rathke um axel hassan tari jesse lawrence theo van Oss, paul tremblay um warren zevon of course you know he wasn't an early reader but um he was an early influencer definitely john landis gave us a, one of the best transformations ever definitely um gary brandner gave us indirectly the howling you know i mean he gave us the howling novel but i think the howling movie is actually better and the howling was the very first werewolf I encountered that I can remember on stolen VHS. And man, did I love that movie. I watched that movie over and over and over and over, and I still watch Howling over and over and over. I love, love, love that movie. Um, um, Jesse Bullington, he's the dude who um, called me up or wrote me or something and said, hey, I need you to write a story for an anthology. And I'm like, can it be about werewolves? And he said, sure. And so on the last day before it was due, I remembered, oh, yeah, i got to write a werewolf story. So I sat down and I wrote what became the first chapter of Mongrels. You know, so without Jesse saying, be in my Letters to Lovecraft anthology, I never write the thing that becomes Mongrels. So I kind of owe the whole book to him. Um, Neil Gaiman, oh, what I told Jesse when I pitched my werewolf story to him, um, I said, you know, I don't want to tell just a werewolf biting people story. I want to tell a 
werewolf story about stories. Um, and my model for that was the issue of Neil Gaiman's Sandman called The Hunt, which is about a grandfather telling his granddaughter a werewolf story. And so that's exactly where this novel starts. It starts with a granddad telling his grandson a werewolf story. Um, so thank you, Neil Gaiman. Um, thanks to Laura Payne. She's down in, um, in Alpine, Texas, and she helped me a whole lot with research um, for the novel that I wrote, or that I half wrote before writing Long Girls. It's, it's called Lord's Highway. I still want to write that novel. I may adapt it to comics. I think it may be better suited for that. But um, writing Lord's Highway and getting so deep into the terrain, which she was helping me with in the culture down there, um, which I mean, I'm, that's West Texas. So it's kind of Southwest Texas. I, I didn't grow up in Alpine. I grew up in the area code right next door. So I know the area, sort of, but I don't live there, so I was hitting Laura up over and over for help. Very, very helpful. Um, Bill Pronzini and John Skip, they both gave us two of the best world anthologies we've got. Bill Pronzini's was, what, 81 or something? And every single story in there is golden. And then John Skip, like, what is it, probably 15 years, 20 years later, maybe it's 20 plus years later, actually, he gives us the big, the big anthology, which has all the goods in it, you know? Um, let's see. Thanks to Mud. Mud, you know, Mud and Rhymes for Young Ghouls, both really impacted or resonated through mongrels um i love mud i've watched mud so many times um i think it's one of the most beautiful movies we've ever had um things they carried i like the way that just the same way with love medicine i like how stories can accrete into a big ball we call a novel you know knock em stiff works the same way it's not knock em stiff we call it more a collection than we call it a novel but still it feels like not because it's in the same place, I think it's because of the same people, you know, and I was definitely going for something like that in Mongrels. Um, man, this is going a lot longer than I meant, I'm sorry. Um, Matthew Hobson, I don't have the werewolf figurine up here, that um, he took me to the toy store to buy, to toy store to buy in Baltimore, Maryland? Is Baltimore in Maryland? I don't know where Baltimore is. I was in Baltimore, though. I know that. And um, he took me to the toy store, not to buy a werewolf figurine. He took me to the toy store because it's a toy store. But I found a werewolf figurine. I put it on my my um, under my monitor. And this was like October or November. And then I immediately started writing Mongrel because I was looking at that werewolf figurine every day. Um, that's why there's that line in there. Um, when I'm a when I'm a werewolf, I'll wear jean shorts. It's because that figurine wears jean shorts. You know. Um. Carrie Vaughn, Benjamin Percy, Christopher Buhlman, Toby Barlow, all the people, all those other people who write her writing the good werewolf stuff. And it's, you know, Carrie, what she does is she actually cares about conservation of mass, which um, Long Girls is quite concerned with in transformations. Yeah, you know, how can a 150 pound werewolf become a 300? I mean, 150 pound person become a 300 pound werewolf? Um, let's see. Did you, uh, Cynthia Romanowski was a student. I went to her grad lecture probably four years ago, five years ago, and she was talking about um, story cycles and kind of consolidating stories into a larger narrative and that really lodged in my head and I thought about it and thought about it then I wrote Mongrels you know um Alan Moore and Watchmen he asks what if superheroes really existed they'd have to deal with the stupid minutia you know and that I, I thought there was a variable there for me what if werewolves really existed where would they get their genes how would they um how would they pass the credit check all that kind of stuff you know um Dan Stillman if Dan Stillman my friend of mine had not introduced me to B.J. Robbins, who is now my agent, then Mongrels would never have gotten the desk of Kelly O'Connor, who edited it. B.J. and Kelly, like, rebuilt Mongrels and told me to do so much stuff to it, which let it be the book it is now. I'm so thankful for both of them. Um, getting down, 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 the people who designed and marketed the book, um, Dale, Rohrbaugh, Marty, Marty Carlo, Barbara Greenberg, also Jessie Edwards, is she, is she not in here? I didn't know Jessie at the time I wrote this, I guess. Jessie's my publicist, and she has, she's killer. She can, like when, when I was scheduled to be at George Martin's Theater for launch day of Mongrels, and Library of Congress called and said, hey, why don't you come hang out with us and Louise Erdrich? Um, she was able to make both of them work. You know, I was like, I think I'm just gonna go hide in a cave. But um, she made it work. Um, Owen Corrigan did the wonderful, cool cover. I love this this wraparound cover. It's so cool. Um, oh, there's Jesse. Yeah, Jesse's here. All right, Jesse and Ashley. Um, and then my wife Nancy. As I say, if it wasn't for her, none of these books ever happen because um, she creates these little magical windows or not windows like hallways in time that I can hide in and write stuff you know and I'm um, very thankful for that 
that's the first time I've ever done anything like this, gone through the acknowledgments person by person. It was really kind of cool. I liked it. I was able to talk about a lot of the stuff that keeps coming up with Margles. It was really fun for me. Hopefully, I got something. And hopefully, if I'm coming to your town and I say some of the same stuff, some of the same stuff, you don't like fall instantly asleep or anything. Um. Anyways, thanks to those of y'all who have read Mongrels. Thanks for reading it. Thanks for buying it. Thanks for engaging it. You know, it means a lot to me that the werewolf gospel can go out into the world. You know, thank you.